Hello and welcome back to Materials Kinetics. Today we are on chapter six, which is numerical solutions of the diffusion equation. So I'm going to share my screen and switch over to the lecture slides. This is one of the shorter chapters in the book. Um, and basically, although we've, we've spent the past um, a few lectures going through setting up the diffusion equation and solving it analytically through a variety of methods. Uh, sometimes it's just too difficult or even impossible to solve the diffusion equation uh, analytically, and sometimes it's more convenient or even necessary to go to numerical solutions. So the, the goal of this chapter is to lay down the foundations for how uh, these numerical solutions of the diffusion equation are obtained. Um, so diffusion equations can quickly become very complicated uh, if they're involving multiple components, which involves uh, matrix mathematics, as we saw last time in chapter five. There can be uh, very complicated initial or boundary conditions or complicated geometries of what we're solving. Um, anisotropic diffusion coefficients, there could be time and or concentration dependent diffusivities, non-isothermal conditions, applications of external fields. So there's all kinds of reasons why diffusion equations can become rather complicated. And as a result, it is often necessary to use numerical methods to solve the diffusion equation. Um, now, it's not necessary to do this, but it is standard practice to uh, use dimensionless variables in, or in order to um, solve the equations on kind of a, a normalized set of position and time axes um, that tends to be uh, kind of more reliable when it comes to numerical representation in the computer, since there's only a certain number of bits that are allocated to each number. It is helpful if we know um, kind of the, if we're, if they're all operating on the same magnitude in terms of the values of those numbers. So often a whole set of solutions, the different parameters can be obtained from one basic solution in normalized or dimensionless variables. And if we have diffusion in a plane sheet of thickness L with a constant diffusion coefficient D, one of the ways, one of the standard ways to um, define these dimensionless variables is as shown at the bottom of the screen here, where we have our dimensionless position, capital X, and this is just our position coordinate normalized to the thickness L of the sheet. And this can be normalized to any Kind of size of the sample that it is that we are measuring. Then we have a non-dimensionalized time. The non-dimensionalized time here is given by a capital T, and that is normally uh, normalized by the diffusion coefficient times time divided by that characteristic length here squared, so dt over L squared. And then the normalized concentration is, of course, the concentration divided by C0, which would be some um, either initial concentration or um, standard concentration um, within one part of the sample. So we've got these three uh, dimensionless variables that have been defined. What we need to do now is to rewrite fix second law in terms of those uh, non-dimensionalized variables. So if we have fix second law here in one dimension, uh, the partial of concentration with respect to time uh, is equal to the diffusion coefficient times the second partial derivative of concentration with respect to the x-coordinate. We need to take this and rewrite it in terms of these dimensionless variables. And the way that we do that is using the definition of the dimensionless variables, we can rewrite um, each of these uh, derivatives. So starting off with the first partial derivative of concentration with respect to x, this can be expanded in terms of this dimensionless position, capital X. The D capital X, D little x comes directly from the definition that is just one over L. And so the DC dx is equal to DC D capital X times one over L. Taking the second derivative then gives us another one over L term. So we end up with a one over L squared. 
Um, so this would be on the right-hand side of the equation. And then on the left-hand side of the equation, we have the time derivative. So this is the partial of the concentration with respect to time. We can expand this out in terms of the dimensionless time coordinate, the capital T. And then using the definition here of the capital T, uh, the derivative of that with respect to our normal time coordinate is simply d over L squared. So we take this, substitute it in on the left-hand side of the equation, um, take this, substitute it in on the right-hand side of the equation, and what we see is that the 1 over L squared cancels the 1 over L squared, the D cancels with the D, and what we're left with is um, simply this uh, normalized equation here, uh, where you know the normalization of concentration automatically cancels out the C zeros on both sides as well. So this um, non-dimensionalized version of Fick's second law is the partial of the normalized concentration with respect to normalized time equal to the second partial derivative of the normalized concentration with respect to the normalized position. So now all of these equations are expressed um, entirely in terms of dimensionless variables. We can solve the equation in terms of those dimensionless variables and then convert back to a regular coordinate system at the end after solving the problem. So physically what is happening here is that we are going to divide the space up into a grid. This is what's called the finite difference method, uh, where we take our continuous space here. So this would be an example of the continuous concentration as a function of of position x here. We're going to discretize this onto a grid where we have a position, say, c0, position for c1, position for c2, so the 0, 1, and 2 position, that this is on some grid spacing, where the grid spacing here is denoted by h. Um, and then after dividing this into this these finite layers, we're going to analyze the flux of matter going into a particular layer minus the flux going out of that particular layer. So this flux going through this plane R here into this layer, the amount of diffusive that enters this shaded region coming through the surface R um, can be written as the diffusion coefficient times time times the difference in concentration between those two. So this is just a, a simple numerical approximation of the derivative of the concentration. It would just be C1 minus C0 over H. That is just assuming a straight line here between um, the C0 and the C1 divided by the distance between the two multiplied by a time step in the diffusion coefficient. And that gives you um, an approximation of the flux going into that shaded region through plane R. Likewise, the amount of species that leaves, that flows out of the shaded region through plane S, uh, can be calculated similarly, uh, but using this um, difference between C2 and C1 to calculate how much is leaving. And then if you take the difference between those two rates, that will give you um, the net amount of diffusant that is accumulated in the shaded region. So all the amount that goes in minus the amount that goes out will give us the, the net change here. And combining those like terms, we get uh, D times delta T, the time step, um, divided by H times C0 minus 2C1 plus C2. So if C1 is the average concentration in the shaded region, um, then the gain here, the gain at whatever the new time step is, meaning the C1 prime minus the C1 at the beginning of the time step, the difference here being the, the gain times H is equal to D delta T over H times this um, combination of concentrations. So this is just um, kind of a, a physical picture of what's happening here with the finite difference method. It's also common numerically to pick um, some normalizing factor here for doing the calculation where the time step delta t is chosen such that d times delta t over h squared equals one half. Um, so that's just a, another uh, common way of simplifying the problems. 
Um, so that's kind of the, the broad physical picture, but let's get into the details of what is happening mathematically with the finite difference method. Uh, we start off with our dimensionless equation here, our dimensionless diffusion equation, after converting all of the coordinates to uh, dimensionless coordinates. Then what we're going to do is take this normalized position space that ranges from zero to one now because it's been normalized. We're going to divide that into equal interval intervals uh, denoted by delta x and then um, equal normalized time intervals given by delta t. And we're going to express those coordinates on a grid. So here we've got the position coordinate along the x-axis and then we've got the time coordinate along the y-axis. And so we also have this on a grid where the x spacing is given by the delta x, and then the time step is given by the delta t. And the way that we solve this is by considering a given point on this grid. And this little c sub ij would be the normalized concentration at this point ij on the grid, where this first index here i, that is the position index, and then the second index here j is the time index. So as we go up in i, we're moving to the right on the position axis. As we go up in j, we're moving forward in time, which is moving upward on this diagram. Uh, now we need to consider the concentrations on the neighboring points, the neighboring grid points here, where you've got uh, at the same time, the concentration of the, um, the grid point to the left, which would be C i minus one comma j, and then the concentration immediately to the right, which is the C i plus one comma j. And eventually we want to propagate forward in time and propagating forward in time corresponds to this point C i j plus one because we're moving one time step forward in time. So the second index goes up in one. So the way that we do this with the finite difference method is to construct a Taylor series expansion. And we're gonna do the Taylor series expansion along both the time axis as well as the distance axis. Um, first, let's start by constructing our Taylor series expansion in the time direction, keeping position constant. So what this means is that we're doing a Taylor series expansion to predict what this point is forward in time, the Ci j plus one expressed in terms of the Cij. So our equation here for C i comma j plus one is we're starting with the current concentration C i comma j plus then our linear term is um, the time step here delta t times the first derivative of the concentration with respect to, to time at that position plus one over two factorial so one half times the time step squared times the second derivative plus dot dot dot. And of course, with the Taylor series expansion, this can continue with as many terms as you want. But the reason we do the Taylor series expansion is to truncate it. And if we truncate this after the linear terms, if we throw away the quadratic term and all the higher order terms, then we have an approximation for the first derivative of the concentration with respect to time. So throwing away the quadratic term, uh, you can bring the Cij over to the other side and divide by the delta t. And what we have is that the partial of C with respect to t is approximately equal to the Ci comma j plus one minus the Cij. So the difference between these two divided by the time spacing here, delta t. So this is our um, Taylor series approximation of um, this time derivative in the context of um, the finite difference method. Now, let's do our Taylor series expansion uh, along the spatial direction. And we've got two equations for this. One is the equation for this point on the right. This is the C uh, i plus one. And then the second equation is for the point on the left, the C i minus one. So this first equation here is the point on the right. The second equation here is the point on the left. Again, we start off with the central point here, C i comma j, C i comma j. For the point on the right, we go forward, we go up in the positive direction. So it's delta x times the first derivative. 
when we, when we are moving leftward, we are going in the opposite direction. So it's a minus delta x times the derivative. Um, then for the quadratic term, it's plus one half delta x squared. And this is a plus delta x squared. Down here, this is a minus delta x squared, because but because it's squared, the negative becomes a positive. So the sign here for the quadratic term is the same, even though the sign here for the linear term is different because of the squared here. And then we have the second derivative of the concentration with respect to position. And then this would continue with cubic terms, quartic terms, and so on. Now, what we do here is we're going to add these two equations together. When we add the two equations together, the linear terms cancel out. So these two terms go away because they're the same thing, just plus and minus of each other. The um, two quadratic terms here add together and give us a delta x squared times the second derivative. So adding these two equations together, the linear term goes away, and then we can solve for this second derivative term um, by uh, having the ci uh, plus one comma j plus the ci minus one comma j. We added those two equations together, subtracted the cij from both sides of these equations. So that gives us the minus two times cij, and then divided by um, the delta x squared. So this gives us our approximation of the second spatial derivative in terms of this finite difference method, keeping up to the quadratic terms in the Taylor series expansion. So we have this approximation for the time derivative, and we have this approximation for the second positional derivative. Now what we need to do is go back to our uh, dimensionless version of fixed second law, shown here, and make the substitution in. So on the left-hand side, we have the time derivative. We take this um, description of the time derivative, put it on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, we have the second positional derivative. And so we take this approximation, and put it on the right-hand side. Given um, this finite difference approximation of fixed second law, the goal is to propagate forward in time. So to propagate forward in time, we need to solve for ci comma j plus one. We're solving for the next time step. And so solving for that, solving for the ci comma j plus one, this is in terms of the ci comma j plus, then it's your time step divided by the position step squared times this point to the right, minus two times the central point, plus the point to the left. And so this formula here gives us the calculation of the um, concentration at the next step, the next um, point in time. Um, one can choose uh, to have this ratio of the time step over the position step squared to be one half. That's fairly typical. Um, but you can make it whatever it is that you want, as long as you ensure uh, numerical accuracy. Um, so this is what marches us forward in time. And then going back to the grid, what we do is basically cycle over all the positions, calculating the new concentrations at the next time step, and then keep going forward and forward in time until we've reached the final time of the simulation. Now, there are some considerations that we have to um, consider here when, when we're doing numerical sim solutions. Uh, the first is compatibility. And in deriving the finite difference equation, we've neglected higher order terms in the Taylor series e expansion, which could lead to truncation errors. So this is something that we need to check uh, by making sure that we validate our numerical solution against a known analytical model for a simple set up just to make sure that we know that we're getting an appropriate solution and not introducing systematic errors. Um, the next question is convergence. Does the finite difference solution converge to the exact solution in the limit of infinitesimal grid size? So if you make the delta x and the delta t go to zero, um, do you converge to the exact analytical solution? That is the, the question of convergence. And then stability has to do with round-off error. This is the numerical representation of 
of the numbers in the computer. Um, many numbers cannot be represented exactly in a computer because it is a binary system and there's only a finite number of bits that can be used to represent them. And so, um, you know, there's always the risk of round off errors. So one needs to make sure that we have numerical stability so we're not introducing errors that way. So in conclusion, uh, in this short chapter, uh, we've introduced the standard method for solving the diffusion equation numerically using um, using the finite difference method and Taylor series expansions uh, combined with dimensionless coordinates. So this is helpful for many diffusion problems that are too difficult to solve analytically. Um, the default should be if you're able to solve it analytically, you should try to solve it analytically because you will get more physical insights that way and you will get a um, more exact solution and, uh, you know, a nice closed form mathematical, mathematical expression that you can then use in your research. So analytical solutions are always preferred, but if it's not possible, um, numerical solutions are available. Next time in chapter seven, we will get to the atomic basis of diffusion. Everything we've done up to this point has considered concentration to be this um, continuous uh, variable. And starting in chapter seven, we're going to acknowledge that diffusion is a result of the hopping of individual atoms. And so we're going to see how atoms are hopping in a material and how the collective behavior of that hopping leads to uh, diffusion in the macroscopic sense. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to let me know.